Hello, my name is Diego Bonilla and I am one of the three CSU faculty members working in the California OER Council. In this presentation, I am going to talk about the different research endeavors that we conducted and the findings that we got from those endeavors. All of what I'm going to be presenting today can be found in a white paper that we have published and this white paper can be found at this address down here and that is tinyurl.com slash WP for white paper OER adoption 0401 of 16. So if you type that web address into your browser you will arrive to the full white paper with all of the details of what I'm going to be talking about today. Very well I would also like to start by saying that what I'm going to be presenting today is not the result of the current council. The current council um, has different members from the initial council, so it would be good to give credit to all the people that have been engaged in the design, planning and execution of the different research endeavors. And well, here is the entire list all the faculty members from the CCC that have been involved in the council as well as the CSU and the UC. So all of these people deserve um, credit for the work that I'm presenting at this moment. I would like to mention that there were three main projects, research endeavors, that we tackled. The first one is an exploratory survey, the second is a series of focus groups and the third one is a pilot project. All of these happen at different moments depending on our different needs and they were meant to inform our activities as a council as we move forward. The council was not really tasked with doing research on OER. However, it was very important for us to understand to what degree the findings that we were uh, finding um, in other parts of the world, in, in the U.S. and in internationally, actually applied to California. So we had a lot of research already in our hands from a literature review, but we didn't know for sure if any of that applied to our state. So in the exploratory survey, we jump into that, and it was the very first thing that we did when we started our activities. Now, it is important to mention that this exploratory survey um, was sent out and we got a total number of respondents um, that is 12,030 but the overall number of faculty members in the three segments is very large. We're talking about 10,000 in the UC, 24,000 in the CSU and about 59,000 in the CCCs. So we were only able to capture a very small amount of the, of the whole and it is important to mention that this was not a randomized survey. It was more than anything a convenience survey in which we used several of our already institutional established institutional channels to distribute the survey to faculty members. And from those we were able to get this response that is a very good response when it comes to um, absolute numbers but it's a little bit small when it comes to a percentage of the whole. However, I think that we got important results that were useful to the Council at the time. So I'm going to show you a few of the results from this survey. And the very first thing is we asked our, our faculty how familiar they were with open textbooks. And from this graph, you can already see that the majority of them, about 60% of them, have never heard of an open textbook or just have heard something but they have never really looked at one. So we were talking to uh, faculty or at least faculty in California would seem from this survey to, um, to indicate that they don't have that much exposure to open textbooks. So let's keep on moving forward. From here we ask uh, faculty members to give us several different factors determining what would make them adopt an open textbook. And here I would like you to pay attention to the light blue and the purple over here because this means that the answers were in, in the range of very important or important. 
So as you can see, academic quality was a main consideration for adoption. And that is quite obvious. It has to have a good academic quality or it might not even be considered a textbook. Another thing that was very important was that the information contained in the textbook was current. And this is obvious uh, also and in and well, it is something that we needed to pay attention as we kept on planning our activities. And finally, the pertinence of the content to the objectives of the course. In other words, the actual textbook reflects what is going to be taught in the course and that is also quite obvious. But these are the three most important factors that would influence someone to uh, someone in this survey to adopt um, open textbooks. The next graph is also interesting because it signals, if you can see the total of people that would um, that would that they will feel that is likely that they would adopt an open textbook, many of them, and I'm thinking about more than 70% answered that they were very likely or likely to adopt a textbook. This has to be taken with a grain of salt because we saw that a couple of graphs ago, many of them were just informed about what open textbooks were. That, that is, they were not really knowledgeable of what they were and they received most of this information at the time of the survey. So we need to take this with a grain of salt. Another important part of the OER movement is not only the adoption of OERs, but also the creation of OERs and to start making the ecosystem robust, to, to make it a lot more active in, in many different areas and faculty participate not only by adopting the work of others, but they also contribute. So we asked um, in this survey, in this initial survey, what would be the most important factors influencing the decision to make a book that I created as faculty member an open textbook? So there were interesting results too. If you look once again at the light blue or the purple, you will see that this is the very important and important range that the desire to reduce the cost to students was an important factor. And this is no big surprise. We have seen how high is the price inflation in the last two decades and how difficult it has become to our students to actually purchase the textbooks for the courses. So it is just understandable that our faculty will have that in mind and will have that into consideration if they decide to create an open textbook. I would also like you to look at, for example, um, availability of technical support. One thing is to write the textbook based on the content that I am an expert on. And another thing is to make it digital in a way that can be shareable with many others. So we found that that technical support is important for faculty to consider creating an open textbook, releasing an open textbook. Also support from the administration, and this is at the time of evaluation from uh, our administrators of our work, for them to find a meaningful and valuable academic activity, the creation of open educational resources. And this also was found as an important factor. We will also see that over here, this is another one of the most important ones, and it would be an assurance that the textbook would be professionally edited. And this is also a little bit obvious coming from our tradition of commercial textbooks in which normally we write the textbook and it's sent to the commercial um, editorial house, publishing house, and we have an editor there that goes through the entire textbook looking for errors. So that process is also important for the authors and it is important that it appear in this faculty, in this survey over here. And finally, I would like to point out that the time to develop an open textbook would be uh, probably one of the most important factors influencing their decision. And this is also obvious, especially for the CCCs and the CSUs who have a very large load of their time invested in actual teaching in the process of, of teaching many classes. So these faculty members are burdened with these tasks and they will need some type of release of professional development um, assistance in order for them to be able to work on OERs. 
Very well, so this was the exploratory survey at the very beginning of our activities. And I would, I would say right now that a lot of our findings go more or less hand in hand with what we were finding elsewhere in the country. Later on, we jump into a series of focus groups. And in the case of the focus groups, we had a little bit more elaborated questions a little bit deeper questions than in our exploratory survey. In this case, we were starting to, for example, um, think about what it is the impact of having a digital publication um, for studying course materials. In other words, is there any impact whatsoever of reading a textbook in digital form in learning? Because learning at the end of the day is what we are looking to to affect with the textbook. And we ran these focus groups in three, uh, in three different subgroups. Uh, one of them is for OER experienced faculty. Another one is for OER unaware uh, faculty, that is faculty that haven't heard or haven't experienced or haven't used OERs. And finally, students. And we have um, three uh, focus groups with students because we are mostly trying to understand if that, um, that digital form has an impact in the way that they behave in their, in their classes and also how they study. So we have um, each one of these focus groups consisted in, in three to six participants and lasted about 50 minutes each one of the sessions. And also we provided a $100 stipend in each one, uh, for each one of them. So the results uh, showed us that there are several different kinds of readability factors um, that, that we should consider at the time of assigning a textbook in digital form. And the main reason why we're asking about um, a digital format as the main way to read a textbook is because a lot of the OER movement is based on the ability of computers to re reproduce OERs uh, just by a click of a button, you can make as many copies as you like. And also the ability to distribute this content uh, far and wide using the internet. So it is quite obvious that if the textbook is in digital form to gain from these two characteristics, the duplication and then the distribution, that the, the natural way or the the uh, implicit way of reading these textbooks would also be in digital form. And that's where we were not sure that that was the case. So we found that in reality, it depends how much our students, um, how well our students know how to operate computers and how, how information literate they are, that they can use these textbooks in digital form in different ways. That is, a person that has very little experience with computers and with tablets and e-readers will have a different experience of the textbook than someone that has been using these e-readers for many years and has been annotating, etc. So just the ability to use electronic devices well and comfortably is a very important factor um, affecting how the student uses an, an open textbook in digital form and not only uses as reading but also studies, studies uh, for the final exam and things like that. Another thing that we found is that there are different kinds of uses of the textbooks in digital form depending different subjects or disciplines. Some subjects, for example, the hard sciences, using a digital textbook is beneficial because there's much to gain from using the internal search fun function in the, in the device. But at the same time, for other type of disciplines like history or literature, where you would have to do deep reading of certain things, well, the digital format didn't work as well as the print format. And, and we're going to be presenting details of that, or you can find details about that in our white paper. Also, we found that there were convenience factors that were playing a role in the, um, in the use of digital formats or not. 
and obviously some of these are related to carrying the books themselves in a backpack or carrying them all in a single device. Also we found other issues that regard to um, how permanent the publications are. Some students would like to keep a copy of their textbooks and we found that when they are used in digital format sometimes they cannot um, they cannot keep the copy that they have or they lose access to the copy because technology changes they lose access to the digital rights management that says yes the user can can keep on reading the book etc so out of these we ended up constructing um, a tutorial with technical matters, technology related matters, and human related matters that affect how people use a textbook in the classroom. And, and we not only came to understand that providing a printed copy or the ability to have a printed copy to our students was very important and therefore we included that as part of our request for proposals um, for AB 798 but also we created a tutorial that divided the, the use of a knee reader into different factors or different dimensions and we created that tutorial to show students how to make the best out of the textbooks that they're receiving. We didn't go um, in any one direction, we didn't say digital form is better than print form or print form is better than digital form because it's individual in nature and it's related to how much computers I know, what is the discipline I'm studying and how if I want to keep the book. There are many factors that are individualized and it is up to the individual student to make the best option. But what this tutorial does very well is to engage the student into a critical understanding of their use of the e-reader. That is, not just give it as, as this is what it is and I cannot do anything about it, to rather this is what it is, this is what doesn't work for me, how do I change that, should I switch to print, should I only switch to print for a few pages at the time of studying, should I annotate in the, in the electronic device and so on. There, it's raising awareness of a critical use of electronic readers so they can make best use of the actual open textbook and the content of the textbook. Very well, and from this uh, research endeavor, we jump to our third research endeavor, which was a pilot project. And we're, we, in this case, we're still going deeper and we're trying to understand things that now we are not really finding in the literature elsewhere and, and we're starting to make very specific questions regarding what happens when a faculty member adopts one of these open textbooks? What happens in many dimensions within their universities? So for example, what is the impact on quality? What is the impact on workload? I'm going to jump to this uh, screen. What is the impact on performance? Is there any policy in the individual university or campus that is actually being affected by the implementation of these open textbooks? Are there any usability considerations like the ones that we just explained regarding e-readers? Um, and eventually uh, promote a self-reflection that would inform us about how to best implement these in different campuses with different cultures across the entire state. So in order to investigate all these individual issues, it was important to run this pilot project and we were able to recruit 17 faculty members from the California Community Colleges and the California State University to implement an entire open textbook, just a chapter of the textbook, or, um, or just some uh, element of OERs in their, in their courses and then participate in a faculty survey at the end of the semester, administer a student survey at the end of the semester and attend webinars to discuss issues regarding OER, OER textbooks that can complement their understanding. At the end of all of this effort, they will have to build an e-portfolio describing their adoption. 
And once again, this is not only informing us about detailed things regarding the implementation of those OERs in individual campuses with different cultures, but also is helping us um, move this research agenda further and, and to seek for deeper issues that could affect um, the, ado the adoption of these textbooks. So when it comes to quality, um, these are more of the uh, specific questions that we asked. Um, we already evaluated each one of these textbooks with a rigorous um, instrument and, and we have a good understanding of how they are graded in different areas of the textbook. What we didn't know is if the instrument that we are using is actually also reflecting the perceptions of quality that our students and faculty have. So regardless of whatever we did for, uh, to establish that quality, we wanted to ask again. And that would only make our findings more robust or would help us later on refine things so, so we can do better. So that is one of the issues regarding quality. Not only uh, that, but also how faculty and students perceive um, the textbook and if they're satisfied. Other issues are regarding to workload. Implementing one of these textbooks as a whole normally entails redesigning the entire course. So we wanted to know what does that entail and how much time it takes you in order to do that. Also, we wanted to see aspects regarding performance. So for example, how does the use of one of these open educational resources affects student engagement and learning? Um, how does the textbook perform in the classroom? Also, what is, um, what is, is there any actual uh, relationship with how the textbook was used and how achievable or, or how well the learning outcomes were achieved? That's another one of the questions that we ask regarding performance. Regarding policy, obviously we, we tackled this already. Are there any challenges um, for existing campus uh, policies? We wanted to check on that. Usability, as you know, we checked on, on re readability, but also we wanted to make other type of questions regarding the access to the open textbooks. For example, how well do they work with different CMSs or LMSs um, and and how easy it is for them to navigate from one part of the textbook to the other or from one OER to the other or things like that. We wanted overall usability, usability issues uh, being explored. And finally, uh, the self-reflection in which we are, um, we are thinking that individual faculty members will have a lot of depth in their um, understanding of how well the resource worked for them and we would like to tap on that. We would like to know what are the perceptions overall, all the things that we didn't ask, we would like to, to hear from those and, and learn also. So we got, um, these are the different, um, um, different OERs that were adopted by our 17 faculty members. We have two videos, we have four full textbooks being adopted, we have three instances in which one chapter was adopted and so on. You can read the entire table. And I would like to present to you some of the highlights from, from, from this pilot project. The very first thing is that most faculty were highly positive about all the aspects regarding the textbooks and the ratings for subject matter and design and use of the editorial conventions in the textbooks were really high. So we were quite happy with those outcomes. I think that it is demonstrated that OERs are a viable option. Also seven out of the 16 faculty members that participated perceived that the OER was superior um, than the actual uh, traditional textbook. And that is uh, quite important to, to mention. Another five thought that it was equivalent. Now, um, it was easy for faculty to explain how the OER uh, was to be used, and they have very few technical problems accessing the material. Um, 
there was a little bit of a different story when it came to the ancillary materials or to the support materials that is powerpoints test banks any other type of material i'm going to show a graph later on any type of material that is not the actual open textbook and we found that in that case uh, half of the faculty felt that that the materials the ancillary materials lack quality and that is obviously one of the things that we paid attention to and we are starting to think about how these can be addressed in the OER movement. Um, 14 faculty members, and this is very, very important because we're finding this across the board. 14 out of the 17 faculty members that participated in the pilot project reported that the entire adoption process encouraged them to reflect about their teaching practices. In other words, it seems that many faculty have been utilizing textbooks in a fairly standardized way, and now that they are adopting the OER, they're having a moment of reflection about their own course and how they should design it. And that is very, very important because as we move forward, we need to constantly refresh our practices and the adoption of an OER seems to encourage to do that. And also, they were happy with the idea that they could change the OERs to fit their own purposes in class. And they also were able to share new materials that they had prepared for the OER uh, to other faculty. In other words, participate in the OER environment. So now we're going to go a little bit more in a detailed way. Those were the highlights. So in here you can see that the OER materials had cultural sensitivity, OER materials had current knowledge, and so on. You can see from the graph here below, from the table below, it says that blue is strongly agree and um, orange is slightly agree. And you can see that the majority of people thought that um, the OER materials were culturally sensitive. Um, the rest of them thought that it was just neutral. They thought that the knowledge in the OERs were current. You can see all of them uh, selected that, or most of them selected that. They have a clear, consistent terminology, and they had sufficient and relevant examples. So overall, from this pilot project, we got very good results. When it comes to the actual design of the OER chapters, once again, I encourage you to only see blue and orange, you will see that many of the respondents said that the OER, the design reflected the best practices in the instruction of that subject um, in that specific discipline. Um, also that all the OERs used an appropriate reading level this was for um, the majority of them, once again, we have 14 out of the 17, and that they supported the learning objectives of the course. The OER used accepted editorial conventions. We have a little bit more of a mixed results, but still good enough. Um, we have seven, uh, 16 answers out of 17 participants, and we can see that we have a strongly agree or a slightly agree with many of these effective use of multimedia uh, conventional conventional features like tables like table of contents like graphs things like that visually clearing uh, clear and engaging and free of grammatical and spelling errors so in this case in this slide we're looking at how easy it was to use or to explain how to access the OERs in class. And in this case, now we're looking at the strongly disagree and slightly disagree, which form most of the part of these graphs over here. And the students really had, did not have technical problems accessing the OERs. Also, they didn't have that many problems explaining how to access the OERs. And in this case, we're gonna look again to the strongly agree because in this case, how easy, we're asking how easy it was to provide the OERs to students, and overall, it was fairly easy. 
Also from the pilot project, we came to know what type of support materials would be most useful for the people who participated in the pilot project. And we found several different kinds. PowerPoints, test banks are uh, fairly common, assignments and problem sets are fairly common and simulations. It depends what discipline you're coming from that they would be fairly common or not. But it would be most useful for faculty to have these type of ancillary materials for them to adopt the open textbook. So when we actually ask the faculty members how they compare the traditional textbook to the OER, well, we asked did student learned as well and you can see that we have strongly agree, slightly agree, or neutral for most of them. So this is overall good news. Also, if the OER was thorough and complete, and we also have fairly good responses there. When it comes to the uh, technology skill that was uh, required in order to use the OER, most of the faculty members found that it was uh, you know, it was reasonable, it was easy to integrate, and we have more or less um, mixed results with how much time it took for them to prepare. So this would be comparing the open textbook to a commercial traditional textbook. We asked what it is the influence on teaching, and well, we asked if the stipend was enough for them to work on this problem, and they said that yeah, the stipend that we provided uh, was enough for them to be able to implement the OER in their courses. Also, we asked them if the implementation of the OER changed their teaching. And this is quite surprising because you will see that we have many responses saying, yes, it did change my teaching. And once again, we're going back to that very important factor, which is it seems that the adoption of OER promotes reflection and redesigning of courses in order for them to have higher impact. So we have that um, reflection right there and it happened with almost everybody. And now we have um, what would be the future OER text adoption and we're asking um, probably the most important question which is based on your experience uh, how much will you be interested in, in continuing your participation in the OER uh, movement? And you could see that I would be interested in the OER. Um, most people, 14 out of the 16 that responded to the, to the pilot survey said yes. Now, in this case, we're starting, we're switching, and now we're switching to the survey to students. Um, what did the students say about their use of the OER? And you can see from this table, here we have all of the agrees. And we can see that overall, students were fairly happy. They thought that the open textbooks were well organized, that the font and format was readable, that the layout was readable, the graphics help their understanding of content, and finally, that the examples helped too. So we have uh, what it is the previous experience with OER materials and students reported that they had many, many different experiences with different OERs and especially with textbooks, we had uh, the largest amount. So the majority of them were um, exposed to open educational textbooks and many of them had different type of exposures to different type of content or ancillary materials. Um, overall, as it happened with faculty members, they said that the OER chapters were easy to access, they were not difficult to get, and that the reading was engaging, that the reading helped understand key concepts, and overall, if the, the OER met their expectations. And once again, we're seeing the blue and orange fairly high up, the gray is uh, neutral and we have very little of the remainder there. Now in this case we are starting to ask that question about how students are using the uh, textbook if it's in digital form. If it comes to them in digital form do they keep it in digital form or they print it? And as we can see many didn't read the book at all 
Um, some people use another type of uh, e-format reader, so this is digital. It was integrated within their LMS, that is, this is integrated in a browser window where they're accessing other course material. The majority of them, and this is a preference that we also found in the focus groups, prefer PDF format as the main format for accessing these textbooks. And finally, 71 of them decided to actually print the textbook, even though they got it in digital form. This one is an interesting one because it is being asked how often do you read the textbook. It is quite important to see that a very large number of students only read the textbook once. And I think that this might be ca the case just before the exams. S many of them never ever use the textbook. Many of them decline to answer. And then you can see that the most popular answer was two or three times a week. So in the survey, we asked uh, students comparing to a uh, compared to a traditional textbook um, where the chapters uh, cover all the topics thoroughly. And, and as you can see, we had a very um, large amount of responses that are green, blue and yellow. In this case, they indicate strongly agree, slightly agree or neutral. And the majority of the students thought that that was the case. This is also the case for OER chapters. Um, and, and they think that the overall OER chapters were better than in traditional publications. Um, as you can see, this is another one in which it's talking about the, what is the easiest way to use the textbook. And we saw that many of them thought that reading it online was the easiest way. And then we had some people printing the book uh, through the bookstore or they printed it out themselves. Many of them use a laptop computer and a desktop computer to read the textbooks. As it is explained in the tutorial that we produced, um, this promotes a different type of reading in which more annotations can be made than if the textbook is being read on a tablet or a cell phone. So that is important to mention. Finally, as part of these um, as part of these slides, we also incorporated all these links to all the e-portfolios that were created in the pilot during the pilot project. So if you would like to have access to any of these, you can access our slides, move to slide 39 over here, and you can have direct links to each one of these e-portfolios if you're interested. And once again, you can get access to this recording and to the slide that, that I used uh, later on. They will be placed on the AB798 calendar. And also, um, you can have access to all of the details of this research project and their findings by accessing the white paper that I mentioned at the beginning. So thank you so much for your time. I hope that this was useful. Okay, bye-bye.